and I'll just list them up on the board. Okay? Uh, in fact, why don't... In Excellent. Pardon? Ah, brilliant. Okay. Good. Excellent. Well, we, we may need it if I, there was one question about covenant, which at least they, I might need to do. Anyhow. Um, so, uh, questions? Yep. Okay, good. Covenantal regeneration. Uh, sure. So, you will see you can see that. Yep. Uh, ne- anything over here? Any other questions here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. So, HC uh, discipline. Yep. Uh, stillborn baby baptism? Sure, okay. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Well, if you, you've, you've got a liturgy already, haven't you? Sorry? You've already got a liturgy that does that, haven't you? Ah, right, okay. Okay, that's really, uh, yeah, we'll put that in the confession, the, the discipline stuff. Okay, fine, thank you, that's good. Yep. Good, thank you, yes. I've got, we'll put that with the regeneration one, thank you. Are you saying because we marry non-Christians as well as uh, non-Christian couples as well as Christian couples, should we beef up our Christian couple liturgy to do that? Okay. What in? Not, not liturgy. Everything else but the word. You know. Ah, oh, well, that's in your preaching, isn't it? Okay. That's the answer. Good. Right. Next, and <laughs> that's been answered. Yeah, uh, Xavier. Sounds like this is Rod Chisholm. Oh, is it this is a Rod Chisholm question? Or? Uh, I just, I just, I just want to, I, I, I just want to make this and get clarity here. That's all. Right. Okay. Fine. Good. Thank you. Baptism necessary for salvation. Okay. Uh, the answer is no. So that's if you like. Okay. There's the answer. Thief on the cross. Jesus didn't say quickly wash him. You know, <laughs> before before he snuffs it. <laughs> so no, it's not necessary. Okay? Doesn't mean it's not important. Yeah. Um, Jesus is remembering Passover when he had the last supper with his disciples. Uh, how do we get them doing it as an annual thing, doing it as a weekly or monthly type of thing in what we do in church today? Um, basically, the Lord's Supper uh, can be done any time between daily and yearly. You have the parallel of daily sacrifices in the temple and an annual Passover. So anything in between. Okay? You, have, you work out your culture, what, what, what's appropriate. Um, Cramer had it, you know, roughly, you know, apart in colleges just once, once a week, in colleges and universities, but um, other places would be once every month or once every three months. So it's a cultural thing. Is that, answer, that sufficient answer or not? Well, basically, as often as you do this, do this remembrance of me. So you can do it as often as you like. 
You ought not to do it less than annually. How's that? You got a question? Yeah, I've done this, Simon. Clarify on that, yeah. Because um, Cranmer has uh, uh, an introduction to the Lord's Supper that is to be read out before the Lord's Supper is taken. We do the Lord's Supper sometimes, in some places, two or three times in seven days. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't be reading that introduction every time. So in Cranmer's mind, did he have, did, did, in his mind, was he expecting that we would do communion now? No, I don't think so. I, 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 it's, it's only in the colleges of, the, of Cambridge and Oxford that they, it was um, a weekly for communion. And then, I don't think it was mandated. Morning and evening prayer is every day, but that's, there's no communion. There's no, there's no sermon in morning and evening prayer. The sermon's only in, in the Holy Communion at that level. Um, and then you could have the Holy Communion and morning prayer together. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's in the Book of Common Prayer. Oh, okay. Fine. Right. Good. We can come to that. Yep. So that's the words of administration. Words of distribution, actually. Yes. Uh, Peter. <laughs> That's the question, is it? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, good. Right, culture change in. No. Okay. Um, that's the answer. Uh, but you might want a, a longer conversation about that. Uh, some of these things, it might actually be, I don't know, maybe I'm, we're not going to get through them all I can see in our time, but we'll see how we go. But I, I'm, I'm still hanging around here till after lunch. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Cross-border ministry. Yep. Got it? Done? Right. Okay. Um, I'll deal with that one first. Uh, Cross-border ministry. Um, one of the, the uh, and from a biblical point of view, Paul didn't want to preach where someone else had preached. On the other hand, uh, and he, he states that, so he, he moves off to, to new cult, new fresh territory. On the other hand, when he goes to Rome, where the gospel's already been preached, he's coming there to share the gospel with them in chapter 1. So it's not an, it's not an absolute statement at that level. Uh, in the early church, of course, in the apostolic times, uh, there was no uh, jurisdictional problem. Uh, Jerusalem was clearly the head, in term, or the lead church where the, course, the apostles were there. Once the apostles disappear or die, you've got no longer apostles so Jerusalem C becomes sort of like the mother church, but then you get um, Antioch and uh, Constantinople, Alexandria, uh, Carthage, as, as big as C's, if you like, S-E-E, -E, um, with regard to that. And so the responsibility of church was taken within that. And so the Anglican, the Anglican structure, don't forget, is built upon feudalism, uh, where you have feudal lords with certain dominions. Uh, in, on the continent, in, in Switzerland, it was the city-states, a, a different kind of structure. So you don't have, you don't have parish structures in, in Switzerland, but you do in, in England. And this, I think, it all comes out of the culture of, of where they are. So feudalism lends to bishops and city-states lends to uh, presbyters. Uh, so I think that um, the whole question of cross-bordering, uh, 
Borders are man-made. Uh, the gospel is a divine imperative. Therefore, if the gospel needs to be preached in an area where there is a man-made ob- uh, objection, I, I would go with the, the gospel mandate. So I think that the border crossing, so-called border crossing, must be seen in the context of the divine mandate to preach the gospel. And uh, so Paul will do everything in his power to do that, even though the Roman government might prevent him from doing things. And the apostles likewise, you know, you tell us not to preach the name of Jesus, you know, that's kind of a border crossing, not in our city. Well, you can do what you like, but we, we can't but do what God has told us to do. Okay, so that's, I think that's my answer to that one. Uh, in terms of Peter Stavitz's uh, question, uh, look, I think that has been true. I, I would never have thought that was true of Armadale Diocese, but you might want that people might go to a Baptist church if they're going to other parts of New South Wales or other parts of Australia. In the end, people need to go to a church where the gospel is going to be preached. Um, I would not have thought that anyone in Sydney, anyone intelligent or knowledgeable, would think other than you'd go to a, an Anglican church in the Diocese of Armadale because it's, it's part of us. Uh, in, in part of us in terms of the evangelical family of God. So that just needs to be reinforced in, in, on those, those cultures, that's all. And I wouldn't go to... Good, I, I wouldn't go to Baptist church for other reasons. Uh, now, um, your question, Gus, your, your question was... What was the last question? Uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can see. Um, oh, good. Oh, you're right. Oh, lovely. You're right. Your words distribution. Okay, words distribution. Um, you know that Cranmer in 1552 had um, uh, the the uh, 1549. He had the words, um, "The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you." Uh, do this. Um, uh, Eat this remembrance that. Sorry, I'll change it. The um, they had he has one set of verse, one set of words in um, in 1549, another set of words in 1552, and what Elizabeth does in 1558 is combine them. So the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul into everlasting life. Take and eat this remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Um, my recollection is that 552 was feed on him in your heart by faith of thanksgiving and the preserve element was in the 1549. So we've got both in the 1662. Um, the, a lot of modern people say the body of Christ keeps you in eternal life, the blood of Christ keeps you in eternal life. If you've got a lot of people to communicate, Cranmer thought that the words were actually all said to one individual person. If you're doing that along a, a communion rail, that can be a very long time. I personally do it over three people. And, then, and sometimes people wait to, for the take eat. Um, you ought to stop the practice of this business of eating the food like that, uh, which is most uncivilised. Uh, the words of Jesus are take and eat. So when you're teaching your confirmation classes, don't do this Anglo-Catholic stuff that can't be touched by human hands, even though it's sitting on a human hand and gobbling it up like that. I don't know where that practice came from, but it's, a, it's, it's ugly. So, um, uh, but in terms of the words of, of administration... I think that if the words are there, if you're going to use those words, you're free not to use the words, preserve your body and life, your body and soul. But if you do use the words, teach them what it means. In other words, being united with Christ is not just a spiritual thing, but a bodily thing. It's our whole body. It's our whole person. It's not like this body is, you know, is just a carcass in which the real me lives. This body is the real me. And, and so, therefore, that's why the language of body and soul is there in Cramer's words. Okay? Um, uh, was there anything else on words distribution? Was there another question on that or not? No, that, that's it. Going up. Uh, covenant election I'll do together. Uh, stillborn babies. Okay. Uh, that's uh, a very good question. I was asked to baptise a, a stillborn baby in, in hospital. Uh, non-Christian parents. So what I did was I, uh, I said uh, it's very difficult to baptise a, a dead person, uh, notwithstanding 1 Corinthians 15. Um, it's very difficult to, to do that. I said, but this child has been made in the image of God. 
And we can honour that. So I want to, and I wrote a little service for them, I want to honour you in your grief that this child is an image bearer. So let's name the child, and I use the naming service for this, so that you can, and, and let me bless you as the parents of this child with regard to uh, the gift that God has given you but for a short time. And, if, and this may well be a means whereby God is saying to you, what is life and death all about? I didn't have the opportunity, so I had to do a naming service, not a baptism service. My, my assistant minister, before I came, had baptised some dead babies and I challenged him about that. I don't think that's the best way forward. However, one of the questions that will come, and I'm sure you'll get this question, uh, is my child in heaven with regard to... And if you've got, if you've got a Christian parents, the answer's obvious. I trust you realise, yes, your child is in heaven. Okay? Don't prevaricate on that. But if you've got non-Christian parents, I'll give you the answer that Broughton Knox gave. Broughton Knox, I won't imitate his accent, but um, uh, Broughton Knox said something along these lines. Oh, you want your... Oh, sorry, I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> uh, you want your child to be in heaven. Oh, and you won't be there. Well, that'd be odd, wouldn't it? I think the best thing for you is to repent and believe in Jesus, then you'll go to heaven. And I'm sure God in his mercy will fulfil his covenant promises knowing that you're going to be in heaven and bring your child with you. But wouldn't it be terrible if your child was in heaven and you weren't there? So use it evangelistically in terms of actually thinking where they're going. With you, don't have to, you don't have to actually answer the question. You actually put it back into them. Wow, I want my child in heaven, but if I'm not going to be there... How, how, what's the point of that? So that, I think, um, puts the question back into them with regard to where they stand before Christ. Um, I have no doubt that God in his, in his retrospective mercy uh, can save a child uh, from non-Christian parents who happen to be elect and happen to be, become regenerate um, after the event. Uh, that, I think... Uh, although there's no text for me to stand upon other than shall not the judge of all the earth do right uh, from Genesis. Anyhow, that's my answer to your, to your still one. I, I, would, I still wouldn't baptise a child of non-Christian parents. I don't know that it's a sin. I just don't think, I don't know what it means. Uh, the child's already left this world. Nothing you can do in this life can affect that child's destiny. And baptism is identifying... Uh, that child's destiny. Uh, however, it wouldn't be a sin to baptise to baptise the children of of, an, of, of believers. It, it wouldn't be a sin, in as much as you're saying this is a Christian child, and this this child's sins have been washed away, and you're going to give a decent burial to the child and a, and a proper burial, and it'll be a Christian burial. So you could, you know, at, in that context, I can see a reason for baptising it. I don't think it's necessary. It wouldn't be my preference. But like my remarks on baptizing, having a person being baptized twice, I don't think it would be a sin to do so, if that's helpful. Um, uh, Lord's Supper discipline. The Lord's Supper discipline. Uh, there's a verse in 2 Thessalonians. which is instructive with regard to uh, discipline. If I can just uh, find it for you. Um, right. Uh, in verse 6 of chapter 3. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, but we did not eat anyone's bread, etc. There that is very interesting, isn't it? Keep away from any brother um, who is living in idleness and not in, con not in accord with the tradition which you receive. It's not just his idleness is his only sin. He's not living in accordance with the tradition. There seems to me there to be some kind of um, uh, temporary removal 
of the brother or you're removing yourself from the brother in, in terms of discipline. I, I think that the ultimate discipline, excommunication, so you may suspend, as I said, people from the Lord's Supper. I think the question came up, what if a person's been suspended and they still come up to the rail or whatever where you come to? If you've suspended them and had a conversation with them and indeed even had the bishop's endorsement, then you need to say to them, they come to the rail, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not able to give you the Lord's Supper today. It requires repentance. Meet with me, talk with me about your repentance, but then you're going to have to pass on and, not, and give it to them. That's my view. We should never have instantaneous excommunication at the, at the rail. We have not spoken to the person beforehand. That would be improper. Uh, even if you've got people, uh, see, in, and from a covenant perspective, you're not judging people's hearts. If you've got visitors coming, you're not going to give them a quiz. I mean, the Presbyterian Church would, would quiz them before they even come to the Lord's Supper. In, in Scotland, you used to get tokens, like you know, admission, admission tokens, to come to the Lord's Supper. It was, it was a quarterly event in um, the Scottish Presbyterian Church. But uh, I think that we, you, you embrace them, believing they've just said the, the Nicene Creed in the service, so you embrace them in terms of coming to the, to the table. But if a person has been, as it were, disciplined through prevention from coming to the Lord's Supper, then you need to fill that. Otherwise, you've, you've lost all your teeth. And you, you, take, you, you take the flack with regard to that. I would say, in, in, a, in your first conversation... You need to say, therefore, when the, if you're coming to a Lord's Supper service, you must stay in your seat and not come forward. If you come forward, I won't be able to. You cannot share communion with us because you're not in fellowship with us until repentance takes place. Yep, certainly, Rod. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Um, the judgment upon yourself is actually for your personal, your, your personal thing. Uh, you, need, you give that warning in the liturgy, uh, unless you're in love and charity with your neighbours, if you, if you eat not discerning the body, and this is to do with the discipline, if you eat, uh, you eat judgment upon yourself. That's true. But that's for you to personally discern. The discipline of the church is a different kind of discipline. You are, you, these are holy elements which you do not want to give to, to, to those who are out of fellowship with us. Uh, therefore, no, it's a different kind of discipline. It's, a, it's an auto-discipline in 1 Corinthians 11, and this is another kind of discipline with regard to the people of God. Okay? Which you see reflected in the Passover, only those... Uh, only males who are circumcised could participate in the, in the Passover and women who are in family situations like that. That help? Yeah. Glenn, um, just follow up to that. Supposing with the same-sex marriage issue that goes through and then we find that the anti-discrimination prevents us from discriminating, um, that will affect perhaps what the server of the Lord's Supper will end up doing. Is not God himself the primary excommunicator? And in that context, just assuming that things go a bit feral for us over the next few years, and people demand to come, can we not exhort them in terms of what the, what the prayer book says, and then when they come say, you need to be aware I, I'm aware of that, and, and Broughton Knox used to say that uh, Broughton Knox was in favour of, of the word does a discipline, not, not the, the ministers of the word. Uh, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. Um, it's certainly the word, the, the word will discipline anyway, and, and, and people who do eat illegitimately will eat judgment upon themselves. That's true. But our job is to administer the Lord's Supper to those who have been saved. And therefore, it's not my job to allow people who are not baptised and not in fellowship with, with Christ and, and his people, uh, I, it's my job to exclude them. So I don't, I'm not going to care about any discrimination laws. I'm not going to care if it takes me to jail. Uh, I'm going to exercise the discipline of Christ with regard to that. And so that the uh, uh, Matthew 18 passage 
and other passages in terms of um, uh, in 1 Corinthians, the way in which Paul deals with the, uh, the immoral person and he's not a brother and you therefore cannot treat him as a brother. So that's, that's my view. I, 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 I'm stronger on, on proper discipline in the church uh, than, as it were, a passive discipline of allowing people to just come and make judgment on themselves. That's, that's, that's just my view. That's true. I always, when I, when I gave communion, I'd always say, if you are baptised and love the Lord Jesus in fellowship with him, you are welcome to come to his table. It's very important that you actually say, if you are baptised. Uh, for two reasons. It reinforces your congregation's appreciation of baptism. That's, that's a good thing to do. And secondly, it recognises that is the point in which you are identified as a Christian. We don't have membership roles, you're quite right, at that level. Uh, we're an open church, we're not a closed table, but we are not a table which is completely open. It, it, it is a table of discipline. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, I I don't always do this in the thing, but in, in my counsel, I would con- I would uh, repeat the rest of the verse from John's Gospel. If you love Jesus and keep His commandments, because my when I say if you love Jesus, I'm assuming they keep His commandments, because that's how Jesus treats it. So in, that would be a pastoral conversation. Uh, I'm not going to know everyone. I mean, in a large city church, you're not going to know people coming in and you, and, you, and you leave it in their hands and then that'll be the auto-correction of eating judgment on themselves if they're not in a right relationship with God. But if they're, reg- if they're regular members of the congregation, then I, I would see that and, and have conversations and if there was any obvious sign of disobedience to God's word, that would require a disciplinary conversation. Okay. Um, we down to the last two? Right, okay. This is why the board's here. What's our time? Have we got quarter now? Yeah. Right. Uh, can you see this from here? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want this out, out again? Do you want this out here again? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, you're probably not going to catch this on the mic, are you? Better on? Uh, the classic way in which Israel saw the world was to see um, this this is the, the people of God and this is the world. A very clear demarcation uh, identified by circumcision of, uh, of specifying those who belonged to God and those who didn't. Uh, post Abraham of course, Noah wasn't circumcised. Uh, but the distinction between uh, the people of God and the world so in the Psalms, it's the righteous and the wicked. Okay, you'll see that constantly in the Psalms, the righteous and the wicked. And, uh, and of course the world divides after Adam and Eve with regard to Cain and Abel. Uh, and then you get the, um, uh, even though uh, Cain and Abel and then, and then Seth are of the, of the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 is the seed of faith. And so in actual fact, what you've got in the unfolding history of the Bible is what I describe as the battle of the seeds. And the battle of the seeds is within the people of God, you actually have a battle between those who are truly of God and those who are not of God. So you see it constantly coming up throughout the um, Old Testament where starting with with, um, uh, Adam's children, with Noah's children, so Ham becomes a seed, uh, if you like, a seed of Satan. Uh, remember, so Genesis 3.15 is critical. The seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. So it's these two seed in battle lines. Uh, you see it all the way through Israel's history with regard to Abraham uh, and Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, you see it with Jacob and Esau. You see it through the 12 tribes. You see it with Solomon. 
uh, with regard to that and many of the, the seeds of, of David. You see it ultimately in John 8 when Jesus uh, says to the Jews, you are not of Abraham. Yes, we are of Abraham. No, your father is the devil. And he's using the theology of the seed of Satan from Genesis 3.15 when he identifies the Jews as the seed of Satan. Hence their father is the devil. So this construct is not going to work. But that's the construct that the Jews had. We're the Jews, you're the world, you're damned, we're saved. The righteousness of God for them was God's going to save Israel and damn the world. Whereas, you read the prophets, the righteousness of God is going to come actually into the household of God and bring judgment in the household of God, uh, to which Peter refers in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4. So, one in actual fact is it's much more, it's much more um, nuanced than this bold uh, statement. Uh, what you've, you've still got, of course, if I say um, uh, God's people here, but, and this is the if I, like, if I call this the covenant community, it's discernible who the covenant community are. If you like, I'll, just, I'll use this illustration here. In actual fact, in Israel, here is Israel, but that are those who from God's perspective are the elect. They are the elect from the decretal perspective. It's a dotted line because you can't see the boundaries. But the Bible describes this as Israel. So when Paul says in Romans, not all of Israel are Israel, which is a kind of confusing, conflicting, contradictory statement, he actually means this. Not all of Israel, that is the covenant community which we perceive to be uh, identified as Israel, are actually Israel. This is, if you like, the true Israel, known to God at that level. So the secret things belong to the Lord our God. That is the secret things. We don't know that. But the things which are revealed belong to us. So we can see who the covenant community are, but we don't know um, who who it is. So, for example, out here is the woman um, of Zarephath that uh, Elisha uh, uh, brings healing to. The um, Rahab is out here. Ruth is out here. Now, in many ways, each of these people are actually incorporated into Israel. Right? So they're there. Uh, the citizens, citizens of Nineveh, from Jonah's preaching, actually stay out here. They don't actually move into the covenant community, but they're clearly saved. People here are, uh, for example... So, uh, David is clearly in here, but Saul is out there. He's a Jew, he's part of God's people, but he's out there. Where is Solomon? I tell you what, I, reading through 1 Kings with, with Rick, uh, I was more, I think I previously thought that Solomon was probably in here. I'm kind of thinking that Solomon's out of here actually now. Uh, if you read the way you've, you've, you've broken my laws, you've followed the devices of your heart and you've, uh, you've worshipped other gods. That's the disobedience that, which brings the judgment upon Solomon. That's my current thinking anyway. I mean, it's always, you know, it's easy to, to do with biblical characters in one sense um, and, and, and we can never do this with our own congregation. So, because uh, if I come out of the New Covenant, what, what we've got with the New Covenant is... You've got, the same, you've got the same sense with regard to that. So you've still got the world out here. This is, uh, I'm going to say here, the people of God from the covenant perspective. And this is the people of God from the decretal perspective. That is, from God's decrees. Now, the interesting thing is this. The language of the Bible uses the same language for whether it's decretal or covenantal. That's very important. So, when when Paul writes to the saints at Ephesus, he's speaking of 
the saints, the identifiable saints in the church. There may be people out here who are actually not a member of the congregation whom God may have elected to eternal salvation, but he's writing to the covenant community. He's not just writing to these people, the intersection point. He's writing to the whole covenant community. And it's very important to realise. So therefore, there is no descriptor in the New Testament which is uniquely decretal. Justified, sanctified, uh, saved, saint, even the, even the righteous. These are languages which, which is the language which belongs to the, the covenant community. Ultimately, it will only be those who are elect from the foundation of the world to whom it will belong. So that's why Jesus can say, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he's talking about that. These people can be rightly described as belonging to Jesus. And that's when they're not fruitful, they'll be broken off. So the last day they won't be saved. This is why, in my view, Jesus chose Judas. If you think about it, would it have been cleaner to have 12 good ones? It's not like Jesus said, well, 11 out of 12 is not bad. Um, you know, only one bad egg, really. Uh, no, Jesus chose Judas, the son of perdition. It wasn't a mistake of Jesus. Judas casts out demons. Judas preaches the gospel. Judas, in Peter's words, was one of us and shared our ministry in Acts chapter 1. It's worse than that. Judas was one of the twelve to whom Jesus said, you will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What does that mean? How do you understand that? Has Jesus made a mistake? Has Jesus got it wrong? No. If you think he's speaking covenantally, he's not speaking decretally. Very important. So when you say your wife or your husband or your your child is saved, you're speaking covenantally. You haven't got your fingers crossed behind your back. You know, if someone comes and does an evangelistic event uh, here and you're you're one of the counsellors, and someone comes forward and says, look, I've just put my faith in Jesus. And what do you say? Oh, well, that's lovely. So many people do that and they fall away afterwards after a couple of days or weeks or months, you know. I don't know whether you're saved or not. Flip a coin, heads, you're in, tails, you're out next. You don't do that, do you? It's like, brother, sister, welcome into the kingdom of God. Christ has saved you forever. Walk the path of obedience in response to his salvation. And you can say that completely, honestly, truly, because you're only using the language of the covenant. See, remember when um, uh, God is upset with Israel after the golden calf and God says, I'm going to wipe out all Israel and start with just you alone, Moses. I'm actually going to wipe them out from the book of life. Those are the words that that God uses. What does Moses say? (laughs) You can't do that, God. You're a Calvinist. (laughs) It's not going to work. You can't fool me. You can't write people out of your book of life. (laughs) See, even God speaks covenantally. What does he mean by that, you say? He means by that that, yes, that's his judgment. And Moses intercedes. When Moses intercedes for the people of Sodom, you know, what if there's 50 righteous? Well, what if there's 40 righteous? Well, what if there's 30 righteous? And he stops at 10. Why? He knows God's a God of mercy, but he also knows the limits of God's mercy, which God has revealed to him. He intercedes for the people of Israel, and God hears Moses' request, which is all part of God's plan. You can say to your people, your names are written in the book of life. Just as Paul said of his co-workers, even though Demas who was one of the co-workers in Philippians, in 2 Timothy, has deserted him because he's speaking covenantally. The language of regeneration can be used covenantally as well as decretally. 
We tend to only use it, we try to think from the decrees down rather than from the covenant up. If you think from the covenant up, you can leave the decrees in God's hands because he hasn't revealed that to you. I think I gave the illustration of the moon. I noticed last night the moon actually had a, a, a finger now. Did you notice that? Uh, and, but you look, if you look at it, you could guess where the outline of the sphere was, but you couldn't see it, could you? Because what God has done is he's told us there are secret things, but he's also told us there are revealed things. He says, I've got secret things, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Because all you need are the revealed things. If you work on the revealed things, that is all you need to honour me and give glory to me. Let me look after the revealed things. So when you've got a, a, a Christian in your congregation and you give a funeral, you declare, you don't say, well, I hope they're in eternal life. I hope they'll make it to the resurrection. No, you say, they're saved. They're now enjoying fellowship with God and they're waiting for the resurrection of the dead. Okay? But you're never making a decretal statement. You're making a covenantal statement. And that's all we can do. That's the language the Bible's given to us. And this understanding, so that whether you can use the language of regeneration, so that's why I can say happily, my, my children, when they were born, they were regenerate. And that's why Cranmer has, when a child's baptised, seeing this child is regenerate. He's using the same concept of the language at that level. And the same way when a branch is cut off, from the, when you discipline a person, you're saying you are now outside the kingdom. When you discipline a person, you don't know whether you're sending a person <coughs> from, um, uh, from here to here, you don't know they're part of the covenant community. You don't know whether you're actually excommunicating and sending from here to here or whether you're sending them from here to here. And it may well be the very act of the excommunication is going to bring them back. The purpose of excommunication is not to settle a final judgment upon a person but to settle a covenantal judgment upon the person to just say you are no longer part of our fellowship and you need to repent in order to be brought back in. And look at the way in which Paul deals with the, um, uh, the person in uh, 1 Corinthians and then, uh, and, and then in 2 Corinthians where he repented, now bring him back. Okay? I had harsh words to you. Once repentance comes, you can bring him back and bring fellowship there. But you, ex you, and you execute him, you treat him as an exile or sorry, as a, a, a Gentile and as an unbeliever. You treat him as. That is, you declare him to be, but you're doing so covenantally. It's when you start thinking, trying to think that you know who are the true Christians, if you start doing that, you've fallen into the trap. See, one of the, the classic problem with, with um, thinking you should only ad baptise adults because then you know that they're truly Christians. You see, you're trying to find out who the elect are. And baptism is not a sign of election, it's a sign of covenant. Big difference. So therefore, when, um, uh, when you're preparing children for confirmation or parents for baptism with, with regard to that, you're treating them as being in the family of God and you can use all the language of salvation with regard to that. So that's, this, therefore, gives you an insight of how you understand Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, which was the great problematic, like John 15 for, for Reformed people, Hebrews 6 talks, listen, listen to the way in which Hebrews 6 uh, speaks of the person who has, um, who has tasted. It's impossible to restore to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Judas was a partaker of the Holy Spirit. How else could he preach and heal people but by the, through the Spirit of God? Who have, um, who have tasted the gift of, uh, tasted the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. Boy, that doesn't fit Judas. What does? 
If they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him up to contempt. This is a description of the person here. Description of Saul, up here. Saul was one of the prophets, remember that? Remember the Spirit of God came upon Saul? He tasted the goodness of God. He was a partaker of the Holy Spirit, but not decretally. And we only know that from Scripture at the end of his life. If you were reading Scripture in the early part of the Gospels, apart from a couple of clues that the Gospel writers give, you, like the other disciples, would have thought Judas was one of the good guys. The fact that at the last supper when Jesus said someone's going to betray them, it's not like they all look to Judas. We know who it is. Nod, nod, wink, wink. Is it I? No one pointed to Judas. They actually thought themselves. Am I the one that's going to forsake you and deny you and betray you? Um, Peter said, I will never deny you when, it, when, when there's a particular prophecy from Jesus to him. I will never deny you. And Peter does deny. And, but what Peter does is repents, whereas Judas doesn't repent. But the language of the covenant still belongs to that. That's why David would not kill God's anointed king. It wasn't him to discern whether whether Saul was in here or not. He knew Saul was in here and that's where he would would be uh, honouring God to honour those who belong to his people. And that's that's the the covenant structure which I tell you, when, when I worked this out 30 years ago, it was so liberating in, my, in pastoral ministry. It, it means I don't have to think, can I say you really are a Christian? Uh, you know, even, I mean, I remember people saying to me, how can I know when I give the, the body of Christ, keeping eternal life, that it actually is going to, this really is a real Christian or not? How do I know what their heart's like? And I say, you don't have to know that. You don't have to know that. So it's recognising that once you've got the covenant categories, believing in the decretal categories, then you can affirm John 15 and Hebrews 6 and the perseverance of the saints. There is no, there is no problem, you see. Uh, can I just give you one more verse? I can see a couple of questions. Uh, are we doing, oh, we need to wrap up. Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, what are your questions and I'll just, then we'll wrap up. gives us the structure. God could have created the world, as I think I said beforehand, telling everyone with a mark on their forehead who the elect are and it would make evangelism a whole lot easier. But no, he actually has a structure. He, he actually, it's his idea to have Israel. It's his, like, his idea to have a covenant community. See, in terms of, if I, if, in terms of uh, limited atonement or definite atonement, I believe that what the Bible says is Christ died for his people. So the language of limited atonement is actually talking about his people. But if you dishonour God, then you spurn the blood of Christ which bought you. And that's a covenant breaker. I don't hold the view, um, I know John Chapman did, uh, that Christ died for everyone in the world. Because there's no power in that. If Christ died for you, then why aren't you saved? If, if he, in, John, in Romans 8, if he spared not his own son for you, will he not therefore give you all things? Well, that's not true for people out there. But you understand now, the verses we've talked about spurning the blood of Christ, because Christ died for his people, Matthew 1, if you spurn the blood of Christ, then Christ's death will not be effective for you. This, these are the ones who can decretely for him. So, definite atonement is not trying to... Uh, one, some ways of explaining definite atonement is to think in terms of the elect. A- and that is true, but the Bible speaks in terms of the covenant community. And that's the, that's the once you've got that, grasp that, it's a difficult concept, but once you've got it, it will liberate you for your pastoral ministry. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I think what you're saying is that the covenant is not a covenant of 
What you just said probably has everybody going. <laughs> Let, reading. Okay, everybody all right? Um, we're going to go to morning tea and then we come back for our, the last of our sessions. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate, but in light of everything that Glenn said, I feel like I want to say to you, go and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> all right? I'm hoping that's an appropriate application of that text. All right, let's go and have morning tea.